The Bill and Kelly Show is recorded at Studio A at Executive Suite Squared in beautiful Hammond, Indiana. Now, here's Bill and Kelly. All right. Hello, and welcome to the Bill and Kelly Show. Our guest today is Hector Klum. He is the president and CEO of Lutheran Social Services in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, Welcome again to our show, Hector. Thank you, very happy to be here. And it's uh, Lutheran Social Services of Wisconsin and Upper Michigan. Ah, ah, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, And so, uh, and besides uh, being a a CEO, He is also an author of a book called My Journey from Boxing Ring to Boardroom, which he tells his entire story about the uh, lifelong lessons he he was taught by growing up in the inner city and uh, then becoming a boxer and uh, what he learned as a boxer and how that translates uh, into his professional life now. So uh, why don't you give us a kind of review about where you came from, um, your youth, uh, because that speaks volumes about where you're at now, and um, and your boxing career, and then finally to where, how you came to be where you're at today. Yeah, thank you. Um, So I grew up uh, on the near south side of Milwaukee, Uh, very humble beginnings. Um, I remember we were one of three Latino families at first. Uh, when I grew up there and there was one particular family and, and kid in the neighborhood that really didn't want us there and he used to bully me, you know, and would call me a spick and the n-word and uh, one time he punched me in the face and came home with a bloody nose and and uh, you know, I, I as I walked into the house, I saw my father and he said, ¿Qué te pasó? What happened? And I told him and he told me that he wanted to take me to the gym so that I can learn how to defend myself. And that's really what got me involved in boxing. I wasn't really interested in boxing at the, at the time, but I ended up, um, you know, my coach, Israel Acosta, uh, who we call Shorty, is really a giant in my life, a giant in the lives of so many in this community. And he put me in front of the mirror and started showing me some boxing combinations and Right away, he told my father, uh, your son is a natural. He's going to become a champion. And he was right. I became a seven-time national champion, competing all over the world uh, with the United States national boxing team. And in 1992, I was favored to go to the Olympics as a welterweight. So here's the biggest opportunity in my life. I was so excited. I was already looking at the gold medal and looking at the potential million-dollar contract. And I realized that I was not focused, mind, body, and spirit for the most important opportunity in my life. And even as I explain this today, it, it, there's that little pinch in the heart because I should have won that fight and I should have been an Olympian. You know, right during that time, I was, I was hurt because I wasn't hearing from the big time promoters and the lucrative contracts and, um, and I was searching. And on December 27th, 1992, I bought my first Bible and gave my life to Christ. And um, I continued to box. Six months later, I fought the guy that beat me in the Olympic trials. And this time I knocked him out in the first round for the U.S. championship. The promoters started coming back and wanted me to turn pro. And, but I put it through a year of prayer and discernment and ended up feeling a strong calling away from the sport. The hardest decision I ever made in my life, because something I worked so hard for, was at the tip of my finger, but I decided to uh, move away from the sport. But it is really that dedication, that determination, that discipline that helped me be a champion boxer is the same dedication, determination, and discipline that I apply into my life and striving for excellence in everything that I do, whether it be as a husband, as a father, or as a CEO, I'm working to be the best I possibly can be. Rags to riches uh, type of story. And, but the thing that, that, that is so important is some of the things that you learned along the way. Because it's just not the work. The, you know, I, I've, I've, um, I worked out 
back in when I was in better shape with some uh, UFC fighters. And oh my gosh, I, the training that boxers and, and the UFC fighters go through is just, oh, I've never seen anything like it. But besides that grit, um, you've also learned about how to conduct yourself. And, and so that, that seems to be a growing theme throughout your book and, and the way uh, what you speak about today. Do you want to talk to us a bit about that? Yeah, I, I think the virtue, it's the virtue of temperance. Um, and when you're in boxing, you learn uh, temperance because when you're in that ring, if you get hit, you can't get mad and, and, and kind of uh, retaliate. Uh, uh, you have to be careful and strategize and, and kind of see what did you do wrong and how do you make sure you don't get hit again? And you're thinking about that, you're processing that as you go as you go uh, through that through that fight, uh, or you might get hit with a low blow, you can't retaliate, and maybe the referee doesn't see it. You can't retaliate with a low blow because you know that now the referee might see it, and then he could disqualify you. Uh, or there's a lot of smash talk, uh, you know, before the fight, and people are gonna you know talk bad about you. You can't let that get to your mind. You have to remain calm and composed and you know, take care of business in the ring. And so you learn uh, temperance and self-control in the ring. And that's an important virtue that we need uh, in life, especially now more than ever. Just think about the, the uh, civil unrest, you know, the, the political polarization that uh, we're faced. And, you know, on both sides of the aisle, it's, it's really divisive and polarizing and I think there's a lot of lack of temperance and self-control in our world. And it's one of those virtues that don't get, we don't talk a lot about, but it's one that I think could make a significant diff positive difference in our society if more practiced it. Right. And, you know, one of the things that uh, back in the day, if you didn't respond or, you know, like you said, if you got hit and you as a boxer got angry, I, two things. Well, the the uh, referee can see it, or you waste your energy retaliating when you're not going to get the points. It's all point system. You've got uh, you you got judges off there always uh, judging, and and you may not hit a square punch because you're angry. Your adrenaline's working, so and it doesn't serve anyone well. Uh, so uh, and that's something that's happening today. Uh, people are viciously attacking other people and. And unfortunately, those people are responding back because they just don't, temperance is not something that pops in their mind. And they, they, I guess they just don't think of taking a deep breath and say, what do I, how do I need to respond to this person? Um, and that's so much, uh, you know, and, and uh, we're going through some times and before the show, I, I, I told you, I feel like we're back in the 60s and even 50s now it just is uh you know everything that we've learned all through this process acceptance uh respect has just seemed to just wash away um so what i guess my uh, question to you is um you know I, I guess when people are in a heated moment is there something that you can do to just draw that adrenaline back and and calm down and and uh, look at a strategy as opposed to blowing up and, and responding with heated words that make you know better than the person attacking you in some ways? Yeah, great question. I think um, it really starts with um, uh, everybody having better listening skills. So let's truly listen to one another. And, you know, you have your values, I have mine, and you know, we should be very proud of our own values, but let us listen to others and respect their opinions. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to agree with one another, um, but if we listen and have some empathy in trying to live in the shoes of that individual, maybe trying to even understand their position or their, their take on a certain matter, but, um, but you don't have to get mad if, if we don't agree. I think that's our big problem right now in our political system is that there's so much divisiveness 
and polarization amongst both parties. I don't think neither party should compromise their values. Neither, comp neither party should uh, compromise their agenda. But there are so many things that we can do as a country that's probably in the center that is for the common good of all and makes sense for everybody. But we never tackle those, those, those challenges because of those polarizing issues, because we can't work together because now I gotta beat you and I gotta make you look bad and I gotta disagree with you. So it's really frustrating to be honest. Um, so I would say, you know, uh, to summarize, we need to listen to each other, each other better. We should respect each other, even in the midst of our differences. We should have some empathy to try to walk in another person's shoes and try to understand why they might believe in that. Uh, and, 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 um, and in the midst of all that, create friendships. Mm -hmm. You know, we can disagree with each other and still be friends. And, it, and it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And uh, gosh, in this day and age, I just, I just pray every day that we get out of this um, uh, mud that we're in uh, and, and we get back. And many people have lost uh, friends, you know, over uh, political disagreements. And, um, you know, and that's the worst thing that can happen. You know, when and uh, and also family members, it's gotten down to where people's families are fractured because certain people believe in one political ideology and and others yet another. And and when it comes to blood, that should never happen. But um, yeah, and but it's you know again, that's one thing that I, I guess that we always have to do is take a step back and. We don't know, you know, and that's something my dad, my mom always taught me as a little kid, you know, put yourself in other people's shoes before you criticize them. And, uh, and that, that, that was a life lesson, but I tell you, sometimes I forget that lesson very easy and, and just, uh, uh, but then when things calm down, it gets heated uh, and I think the heat goes down, um, you begin to realize, well, probably that person went through something that I did not. Probably it's the way that person was raised. And, and, you know, environmental factors a lot of times dictate in how a person grows up and the person they come to. And it's really, it's hard to say this, but no fault of their own, right? It's, it's really, it's the way they were raised. And, uh, and, you know, it doesn't mean at the core they're not a good person. It's just that some of their values may have been skewed by their environment. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, and and so we all have our our uh, our upbringing and uh, the challenges that come along with that, and it's it's more reason why, you know, we should uh, practice another virtue that's that's in my book, and that's uh, the virtue of magnanimity, and that's all about what are those daily habits, those daily rituals, those daily routines, that are going to help you. Uh, be your best self. And so as a boxer, you know, I'm up in the morning, I'm running, I'm running every morning, it could be below zero degrees or, or snowing, I'm out there running, and I'm listening to uh, motivational videos, and I'm talking to myself, and I'm telling me I'm the best, I'm going to be the best, I'm out working my competition, and I'm praying, and and uh, then I'm working out in the afternoon, and then I'm working out in the evening, I'm going to bed early, uh, I'm waking up early, um, I'm eating well. It's all those daily habits and those rituals that allow you to be your best self. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important because when you are your best self, it's not only going to impact you as an individual, it's going to impact your family, it's going to impact individuals in your work setting, and it's going to impact the larger community allowing you to do something that is honorable and remarkable, uh, not only for you, but for those that surround you. So the virtue of magnanimity is not talked about often. It's really about that virtue of striving for greatness. There's a misunderstanding, like it doesn't mean that you're great or that you're pounding your chest. That I'm great because I exhibit the virtue of magnanimity. Again, it's really those, those daily habits, those daily rituals, that allow you to to tap into those God-given talents uh, that you have. Yeah, and it's all about your 
it's it's really your contributions and and because uh, really when we look at it we we all live in this uh, world that you know is is a complex environment yeah. it be uh, biological interaction or you know with some type of technology you know anything that we put into the world is what we get back um, and so uh, but you, so you've established these daily habits routine that really reinforce all of what you want to be your engagement with the world and and really the your environment the other people that you work with um, so one thing I want to call back to you you are in um, really is social services right now and and during the pandemic oh my gosh that's got to be challenging um, and and so you know right now I've got to say you're probably tasked with things on a daily basis being that we have this raging pandemic around us uh, you know people are are being crippled by uh, not having work and not having income, uh, or if they do have income, it's not what they're used to. Um, can you describe it, you know, with your uh, position as CEO of uh, Lutheran Social Services, how you bring that to your position and your team that you have? Yeah, so I have to say that um, I'm, I'm so honored and privileged to be surrounded by an incredible team and I think our secret sauce at LSS is that they are humble servant leaders. And I have learned so much from them uh, uh, over my three and a half year period here. But this is an organization where, you know, we listen to one another. Uh, we have empathy for one another. Uh, we support one another. And we're really trying to make sure that uh, we put um, the interests of our staff as number one, because the better they're doing, the better they're going to be able to serve others. And so our organization, when the pandemic hit, this, these are very tough times. There's no doubt about it. Um, the first, the pandemic, the political unrest, um, the civil unrest. I mean, there's just lots of challenges that make this time very hard for us. But we've been really working together. When that pandemic first hit, we were faced to lose a million dollars of revenue per month. Yes. And if we would have done nothing, our organization would have lost 3.6 million by the end of the year. Instead, uh, this incredible team worked out uh, to do uh, many great things on the expense side, starting off with the leaders taking a voluntary pay cut. Uh, we reduced some expenses. And, uh, and then on the revenue side, we implemented telehealth. And telehealth gave us the ability to serve thousands of people that would not have been served if it wasn't for that platform, and also brought in about $500,000 of revenue per month. So as a result of all of this, uh, and really led with a servant-led heart, with love, with compassion, uh, for the people we serve and for each other, it is likely that our organization will uh, not only meet, uh, but exceed uh, our, our budget projections uh, by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So we feel very inspired and actually really invigorated uh, as we go through these challenges and just how we've been really pulled together to do something that really is extraordinary not only for our extraordinary for our staff, for the people we serve, as well as the, the long-term viability of this organization. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Um, you know, you've uh, said that the, uh, you, you, the title uh, you've stated repeatedly is a servant leader. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that is used more and more today and, and uh, a different look at a leader. You know, we are, we are migrating back in from the old um, autocratic type of uh, dictator type leader to someone that is actually is more blended into their working organization uh, to where that person actually serves the people that work for him. And, and, and uh, why don't you talk to us a bit about that? Because, and still to this date, in fact, oh my gosh, especially what's going on today, that 
phrase keeps on getting washed away, but I think it's so important that we keep it in front of us, specifically those of us that are in leadership positions. So talk to us a bit about that. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, servant leadership is, is a very effective uh, ser- uh, leadership philosophy. And one, if you do the research, uh, Fortune 500 companies that have servant leaders at the top outperform those that don't. And so the research is out there that it's effective. You know, some might feel maybe it's a little soft or it doesn't have um, accountability. Uh, None of that is true. Um, In fact, you know, servant leadership uh, is, has lots of accountability. Accountability to the staff, accountability to the people you serve, and accountability to the credibility and reputation of your organization. So um, there's no conflict with having servant leadership and accountability at the forefront. But what servant leadership is, you know, some of the tenets of listening, of empathy, of healing, of awareness, of the growth and development of others, of conceptualization, uh, and foresight. You know, those are some of the primary tenets of servant leadership and also with a really strong focus on, on those that are working under you. And so for us, we pay a lot of attention to that. You know, we want to pay our staff better, make sure that they're are recognized and appreciated for the good work that they do, uh, but also making sure that we are co-creating our future with them, not to them. Mm. So it's not a top-down approach and says, here's what we're gonna do, here's my, so I would never come and say, here's my vision, here's my strategy and my direction, I'll go execute it. That's not the right way to do it. You don't get buy-in that way, but how do you, how do you involve the staff? Maybe by posing some strategic questions and really engaging them in focus groups and really wanting their opinion and including their opinion in the overall strategy. That's the way you are able to achieve extraordinary results. And I think that's why our organization has been so successful over the many years. Wait, and uh, so as we begin uh, rolling down the show here, I'd like to talk to you more about your book and uh, what inspired you to write it and, and uh, maybe go over the overview about it and talk more about these virtues that you, you uh, ingrain into your book as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, been quite a journey uh, to write a book. I, I was inspired to do it because uh, others encouraged me. They became aware of my story and, and the challenges of uh, my upbringing. You know, I have an A score of six. A stands for adverse early childhood trauma. And an A score of six would indicate that I would have, according to research, that I would have a 1,200% likelihood of having depression and a 200% likelihood of committing suicide. But I was able to overcome uh, those challenges to, to be the person that I am today. So I, I share some of that in my book uh, about the challenging upbringing that I had you know, um, coming from a divorced family. Uh, my sister was addicted to drugs. Uh, I had gangs and uh, drugs and gangs permeated my surroundings. Uh, two of my best uh, friends died due to drug overdose. My uh, favorite cousin died due to gang violence and just had lots of, lots of negative factors that surrounded me, but I was able to overcome that. And in my book, uh, I really talk about how it's really the ver- five virtues um, that I call for life and leadership that help me overcome those challenges. And the first virtue is magnanimity, which is really about striving for greatness. I talked about those daily habits, those daily rituals, those daily routines that help you be the best. I, I, I learned that through boxing, you know, and then the second one is humility. And so humility at its core is about serving others. You know, I think about my mother, uh, how, she uh, loved me so much and loved my um, sister and, and served others, even though we were poor. My father was in Puerto Rico, was completely gone, no money, no support. And my mom um, never complained. Not only did she not complain, but she served others. So I, I learned 
uh, that about servant leadership actually directly through my mom and also through my boxing coach where he would spend nights with me, uh, uh, sacrificed his um, weekends uh, for me, uh, also his vacations, you know, to, to make sure that I'm the champion that I am today, actually. And, and then the next virtue is courage. And that's about facing your fears and fighting to do the right thing. And I learned courage in boxing. You know, when you're enter into the ring, uh, you have intense fear. And any boxer who, who tells you otherwise is lying. And so, but you enter into that ring because of that the dedication, determination, and discipline that, and that self-preparation that gives you the confidence to enter into that ring. And I think we need more courage in our world today. You know, do something that's honorable and remarkable, but prepare yourself to take on that challenge and don't go alone, involve others. Uh, along with you. Perseverance is another virtue in my book, and that's about the virtue of not giving up. And we need to, and, and not being afraid to fail. You know, I failed lots of times in my life. I failed in boxing. You know, I failed uh, in my first, my first, well, I failed my occupational therapy exam, not only once, but twice. Uh, but I didn't give up. And I passed that third time. I I failed a couple major uh, CEO opportunities that I did not get before getting this one. But if I would have quit, I wouldn't be in this organization right now, an organization that I feel so blessed to serve, an organization that serves over 30,000 individuals on an annual basis, 91% of which indicate that we improve their quality of life, surrounded by 800 humble servant leaders. I mean, I... If I would have given up, I wouldn't have the opportunity to be on this show with you right now. Uh, and the last virtue is temperance, you know, self-control and restraint. Do not do something that could ruin your life and career, your reputation. It's very important. So those are essentially the, the, the virtues and the framework of my book. Uh, I've gotten lots of positive reviews. Uh, you know, prior to releasing the book, I, I got major individuals that have endorsed my book, like um, uh, Howard Behar, who is the former president of Starbucks, took Starbucks to, to become a global uh, international uh, company under his leadership. Arthur Brooks, bestseller, he's, at, uh, he's written several uh, bestsellers. He's at Harvard right now as a professor. Craig Culver, you know, the, the owner and, and, and co-founder of, of, of uh, Culver's uh, Food, uh, mm. Great Burgers uh, here. So I've had great individuals like that that have endorsed my book. And if you go on Amazon, there's, uh, since I've released the book, there's about 15 re positive reviews on, on Amazon as well. So go out there and get a copy. My, my uh, website is Hector uh, Colon mke.com. Again, Hector Colon, mke.com. You can find uh, more information about my book. Also book me for a speaking uh, engagement. Uh, and the book is also available on Amazon if, if you prefer that method uh, um, to purchase. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and put that, make sure all that is with the video when this drops later this week. So that that's great information. Uh, Hector, uh, boy, as uh, before, we really enjoyed having you on the show. Uh, I've learned a lot here just uh, re-talking over these, some of these issues and, and something we all have to remember during these trying times, control, think, and, and, uh, I, and, and then perseverance. Don't let this world get you down. And it's so such a difficult lesson nowadays. But uh, Boy, we're so thankful uh, for you, and and uh, uh, I'd encourage everyone to go out there and get up, go on to Amazon and get the book. And and uh, boy, in this time and age, we need some guidance. So, uh, Hector, thank you again. We much appreciate you being on. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we wrap up the show? I just would like to say that um, you know consider pur purchasing my book and. Once you uh, read it, if, if you feel inspired, uh, please reach out to me and share your stories. I, I really have loved uh, so many people, how they find themselves 
in my story, how, how they feel inspired, uh, and how they want to practice one or more of the virtues to help improve their life and leadership. It's been very encouraging. So please, uh, if you read the book and you like it, let, share your stories with me. I, I would really appreciate that. Take care. Uh, great. And well, uh, Hector, I appreciate so much you coming on and sharing all your experiences with us, the virtues you have to speak about in your book. And again, that book's name is uh, My Journey from Boxing Ring to the Boardroom. Uh, and for all of you who are wondering how to get that, it's available on Amazon. Uh, we will provide a link along with this video. So if you want to click on that link, it will either take you to Hector's uh, website or to Amazon where you could find his book. Hector, we appreciate it so much again, and uh, you have a wealth of information and a lot of guidance for us going through these troubled times. Is one of the things that we all have to face with is how do we face adversity or difficult situations that could develop anger? And, and what you're saying is take a deep breath, step back and think the way you should respond. So with that, I uh, wish you the best, uh, Hector, and uh, everyone out there. I wish you a very safe remainder of the week and uh, weekend, and we'll say goodbye for now. This episode of The Bill and Callie Show is brought to you by Dutch Farms, maintaining a family tradition of quality for over 91 years.